comes from Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Friends, let us worship God.
the living God holding those individuals on our prayer list and those people and circumstances that they represent in our hearts and giving them over to your love and wisdom and plan and purpose, we pray. And so we name and we remember Diane and Mike, William and Levi, Jackie and Dawn and Calvin. And as we hold them in our intentions and lift them up to you, we pray for those needs, those joys, those concerns, those sorrows that we bring with us today that are in our hearts but unspoken. We come to you as your children, grateful for our redemption, yet aware of our continuing need of your grace in Jesus Christ. We break your commandments, we fall short of your glory, we and so then we acknowledge our guilt, and we trust that you blot out the transgression of the penitent and indeed cleanse us of all our sin. We give you thanks that we have our advocate in Jesus Christ who gave himself as a propitiation for the sins of the whole world and for each one of us individually. Free us from the penalty of sin and also from the power of sin. Change our hearts that we might be new creations in Christ and bear the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You invite us to make known our requests to you. And so we intercede then on behalf of our nation and our civil authorities. We pray that you would give wisdom to the executive and legislative and judicial branches of our government, be they federal or state or local, that all might govern according to your word and will. We pray for Christian mission and ministry in this congregation and in Glendale's other churches and among your people around the world. We ask that you would bless the reading and preaching of your word in all your churches, that your word would not return to you void without accomplishing all that you ordain for it. We ask that you would raise up those who would share your gospel that all might be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We pray today for those who are afflicted in body, mind, or spirit, for the sick that they might be healed, for those who mourn that they might be comforted, for those who are weary and heavy laden that they might find rest. For those who are discouraged or depressed, that they might find the joy that is inexpressible and full of glory. For those who are anxious, that they might know the peace which passes understanding. We pray all this knowing that apart from you we can do nothing, but in confidence that you are able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we ask or think through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom we pray as he taught his disciples, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
continue to make their way through the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> As we come to see what the Spirit might say to the church, to each one of us from Scripture, let us pray. I let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So if you will, listen for what the Spirit might be saying to you. Listen to God's Word. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes the sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. And thus far the reading of God's Word. Traveling along a gorge in 
Burrington Combe in England and was caught in a tremendous storm. He took shelter with an, a gap or a crevice in the rock gorge through which he was traveling and in that crevice wrote the lyrics to the hymn. Some dismiss the story as apocryphal, but even today there is a plaque that marks that spot that reads Rock of Ages. This rock derives its name from the well-known hymn written about 1762 <clears throat> by the Reverend A.M. Toplady, who was inspired whilst sheltering in this cleft during a storm. Again, I say that to, to note the personal pronouns I and me, the Toplady, used. In the Bible's story, the individual matters to God. The individual matters, though a sinner, that sinner is known by God from eternity past, loved by God, by the Creator from eternity past. Psalm 139 reads, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in, in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book. All of them were written, every one of them, the days that were formed before me, when as yet there were none of them. <clears throat> the Creator in the Bible story enters human history in Jesus Christ to redeem, to save the beloved. We, we sin as individuals and we stand condemned before God. And we are saved as individuals and stand redeemed by Christ before God. Restored and set in right relationship with God, we then find ourselves as individuals in Christian community. Our identity in Christ transcending other identities. Male and female, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, nation and race, all become secondary categories for the Christian. What matters is our identity as individual believers in Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 5 tells us that we are each of us living stones in a spiritual house, that we are priests ministering to one another in Jesus Christ. The scripture affirms the individual. Constrained by scripture, I, I find myself required to reject any ideology or theology that would traffic in collective guilt or collective virtue that doesn't reckon with the reality of the individual. The potential for any given person to exist over against their antecedents of race or nationality or family pedigree or political loyalties or class status. In the Bible's story, we see individuals in relationship with God. God sought out and walked with Noah. God called Abraham and called Sarah. God saved Rahab, who showed her faith by assisting God's people, though herself a pagan, in taking Jericho and the promised land. Jesus called Zacchaeus by name and told him to climb down from the sycamore tree and to eat supper with him. God loves and calls and saves individuals. Ancient societies were tribal. The individual hardly existed. Your life was completely predicated by your, your tribal membership, your group identity and identification. The Bible and the Bible stories God progressively revealed himself more and more fully, led God's people from truth to more truth. And it, at a certain point, <clears throat> we see that break with tribal identity. God reckons with the individual. In Ezekiel chapter 18, the prophet wrote, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins shall die. It sounds a little negative. There's a tremendous declaration of the value and the dignity and the worth of the individual in that state, we are held responsible before God, not for others, but for ourselves. You are not held responsible for the sin of your great 
grandmother or your third uncle once removed. You're responsible to answer before God for yourself. You're, you're not saved by another's faith, and you are not condemned by another's sin. This is a horse I've beaten before and will beat again, but you are not merely an instantiation of a larger collective. You are not only the avatar of a mass or a group identity. You are a singular soul of infinite worth and value. You are you. Are you. God loves everyone. God also loves you in particular. You are the motivation for Christ to enter human history, to take on human flesh, to maintain perfectly God's law on your behalf, who also suffered the penalty of sin on your behalf, also that when God looks at you, he sees in your place, in your stead, Christ's perfect righteousness. You will stand before God, no proxy will stand for you. You're not guilty of another person's sins, and you will not be justified by another person's faith. You alone stand before God, a responsible soul. And, and so, the text today could put to us the question, as the old evangelism explosion would ask folk, if you die tonight and stand before God and He asked you, why should I let you enter my heaven, what would you say? Would you point to your works or to your merit, to your pedigree, to group membership? The gospel throws us on the grace of God, and specifically the grace of God as it has encountered us in Jesus Christ. A singular individual life, saving individual lives. And there's one of the scandals of the Christian faith. First Timothy chapter 2 tells us that there is one mediator between God and human beings, the man, Jesus Christ. An individual, the Son of God, saves men and women, you and me, one by one. We are saved individually, so then retaining all who, uh, that we are, all that we've known. We are loved by God from eternity past and are found infinitely valuable in ourselves. And, and as, as individuals known and beloved by God with a past, with a personality, with individuality, we are joined in a community across boundaries of age or gender or nationality or ethnicity as the body of Christ in the church. We are living stones, a part of a spiritual temple. <clears throat> Richard Rohr offers a cautionary observation. He writes, the body of Christ, the spiritual family, is God's strategy. It is both medium and message. It is both beginning and end. May they all be one so that the world may believe it was you who sent me, that they may be one as we are one with me and them and you and me, John 17. There is no other form of Christian life except a common one. He writes, we are now paying the price for centuries in which the church was narrowed from a full vision of peoplehood to an almost total preoccupation with private persons and their devotional needs. But history has shown that individuals who are confirmed in their individualism by the very character of our evangelism will never create church, except after the model of a service station. They will use it as a commodity like everything else. Certainly, he writes, we must deal with individuals, but the very nature of our lifestyle and our church teaching must say from the beginning what the goal is, the communion of saints. A shared life together as family, the Trinitarian life of God, the kingdom, here. He calls us, Richard Rohr, to a balanced view, a scriptural view of the individual. We are joined as individuals in a community. But in an age, in a historical moment that is <clears throat> leaning on and into collectivism and group identities, we remind ourselves in the scripture passage today that heaven rejoices at the salvation of the individual soul. It is one by one that people enter into a relationship with God in Jesus Christ. And then redeemed individuals gather in community with one another as brothers and sisters in a common family of faith, united by Christ, retaining their personal identity. It's how we come to the Lord's table this morning. Individuals, each of us, 
in relationship with God by faith in Christ, we come to the table as brothers and sisters. So may we know ourselves loved individually by God and united by Christ with one another in Christ's body, the church. Amen. Friends, brothers, and sisters, individuals loved by Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ instituted this sacred supper as the covenant meal of the New Testament, commanding us to do this in remembrance of Him, and by so doing to proclaim His death until He comes. The supper supersedes the Passover as the covenant meal for the people of God, even as the cross supersedes the Exodus as the culminating redemptive event of history. Like all covenant meals, it is both a sign portraying Christ's benefits and a seal confirming or ratifying our covenant with Christ. As we partake of the emblems of Christ's suffering, God confirms afresh the promised benefits of the cross, pardon, reconciliation, and eternal life. We in turn reaffirm our covenant privileges and responsibilities in the present and anticipate his future return. We remind ourselves as we approach the Lord's table, Christ is spiritually present at the table, as the common elements of bread and cup are set apart or consecrated through prayer. This is no mere memorial service. Neither are we to think that Christ is physically, carnally, or locally present. Though the bread remains the bread and the cup remains the cup, they do become the body and blood of Christ spiritually. We enjoy communion or fellowship in his body or blood, 1 Corinthians 10, as we feed upon him by faith in our hearts. And so here we partake truly of spiritual food and spiritual drink. Since Christ is spiritually present, we find refreshment for our souls. Though bruised and battered by the world, discouraged and compromised by sin, still Jesus extends his invitation and restores our honored place at his table. So we do not presume to come to the table trusting in our own righteousness, but only by the great and manifold mercies of God. And so hear these words of institution. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. But the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, let us pray. O God of honor of all mercies and God of all consolation, grant your gracious presence and the effectual working of your Spirit in us, and so to sanctify these elements, both of bread and wine, and to bless your own ordinance, that we may receive by faith the body and blood of Jesus Christ, crucified for us, and so to feed upon him, that he may be one with us and we with him, that he may live in us and we in him. And for him who has loved us and given himself for us. And so, merciful Father, we lift our eyes from the visible elements, even as we lift up our hearts to heaven itself and seek your blessing from there, where Jesus Christ is, seated in your right hand. In joy and Christian love, we come to partake of your table, giving thanks for the great love which you have shown us. Brothers and sisters, is this not the bread of heaven, the body of Christ, given for us? And is this not the cup of the new covenant, poured out for us in the very life's blood of Jesus on the cross? Friends, this table. Is this not love? Is this love? In this, in this bread and cup, do we not see love at this table, poured out and given to us as a gift? First John chapter 4 reads, In this 
is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. With a reminder, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And as has become our custom, if you'll take your, your chalice, and removing the foil from the, the top of the bread, and share the body of Christ together. Friends, the body of Christ, give it broken for you. Receive it. Same way, we're going to refoil from the, the juice, the chalice. As the cup of the new covenant, the blood of Christ, given, poured out for you. Receive this in faith.
and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon and remain with you always, both now.